you so much for this amazing, amazing talk and those very interesting insights. Without further ado, I want to call the next speaker to the stage, Wendy Hall, Regents Professor of Computer Science in the University of Southampton. Uh, Wendy, the stage is solely yours. Oh, I can't see any of you. Hello. The lights are so bright. Um, so, uh, thank you for the invite to talk. Um, I'm not a cybersecurity expert. I know enough to fool some people. But um, uh, I'm actually uh, here to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and wrap it with a cybersecurity layer around it. Um, looking back on the history, which I like to do before I talk about anything, um, I, the first noted uh, cyber virus was, a uh, computer virus was in, the, uh, was in 1971, I'm sure you all know this, on the ARPANET. I was very interested to see that because my world has been very much about developing the web and the internet. And um, um, I remember the days of the 80s when it was all about making sure you had a protected floppy disk before you put it in your machine. But now, of course, this is what's really driven uh, the growth of uh, cyber attacks and cyber security. It's what Chris was just talking about. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the story of the World Wide Web from 1990 to 2015, and it all gets a bit more complicated, but this is my world. This is what I cut my teeth on as a computer scientist, is, um, and how we grew this system that Tim Berners-Lee invented in 1990. This uh, gave us access to the internet from one website that he put up in Christmas 1990 to the trillions of websites we have now and the trillions of people. In fact, in January, we mark the moment when 50% of the planet, this planet, had access to the internet. That's awesome because it means 50% of people have access to the internet within 30 years. It's also awesome because it means there's 50% still to come. And those 50% will be in rural China, rural India, and rural Africa. So uh, we have to take cognizance of this as we develop it. But this is what's really been, is fueled the fact that um, we have a cyber world in which we get attacked um, and, and in which we can, and I'm in awe of the community here that defends people like me from uh, cyber attacks. But um, AI has a different trajectory. Uh, AI comes in waves. I haven't got time to go through the whole thing, but uh, we like to think in the UK we started it with Alan Turing. It uh, then took off as called artificial intelligence. And in the, when I first, uh, first of all, there was, the computers couldn't do very much, so it was very philosophical when it started. Decision trees and could we build things that we then began, oh, and then we always have AI winters, by the way, when people say this doesn't work, so we'll forget that, we'll stop funding it and then it carries on, and so by the 70s and 80s, when I started in computing, it was all about developing expert systems. And, but people were still talking about it from a philosophical point of view. Then we had another winter, and then we started to develop, the community started developing the advanced neural networks that form the basis of the deep learning we have today, but everyone said in those days it wouldn't work because the computers weren't powerful enough. And in fact, what they didn't have was enough data, so we, we had another winter, and now we have this wave of uh, AI today means really machine learning, deep learning, uh, networks of nested neural networks, and we have machines that can beat uh, press champions, uh, ch uh, chess champions, and, and the Go champions, and Jeopardy champions, and do amazing and clever things with data. We don't know how this wave's gonna work out, but it, it's a pretty powerful wave at the moment. And I'm sure most of you are using AI in your work. Um, I don't know how powerful the AI is. Um, it is a hype wave, potentially. We have to see where it goes. We may have another AI winter as it bed this beds in. And we look for the next generation of AI to come. And we're a long way from the general AI that the sci-fi uh, films and books have, have forecast. And it's a philosophical debate whether we're going to get there. But why AI now, why the wave now? It's because of the availability of very, um, this is a Chinese computer, by the way, um, a very powerful um, 
supercomputers and immense amounts of data, largely driven by the internet and our ability to share data, evolve data, store it and analyze it using the um, algorithms that have been developed and machine learning as it evolves. There are lots of opportunities, um, health, uh, automated vehicles, I don't have to go in audience like this, I haven't got time to go into them. Um, someone just asked me in an interview, are we replacing teachers? No, but we could have very, very good personal, uh, personal tutoring systems. Um, and energy uh, in terms of, you know, can we help, can we use AI to help us uh, sustain the planet, to help us control our use of energy, use the most effective energy. All these have been well noted. And governments around the world, including the UK government, are developing strategies for dealing with AI. I co-wrote the UK's AI strategy with uh, Jerome Pacenti, who at the time worked for Benevolent AI, he now works for Facebook. Um, and it was all about growing the AI sector in the UK in the face of the two superpowers of the US and China. And how are we going to make sure that we can grow jobs in AI in the UK, retain talent, grow new companies, and not lose everything to the superpowers? We have a great legacy in AI in the UK, of course. We have wonderful research groups at our universities, and we have a fantastic uh, tech st startup culture that we have a lot to build on. Key recommendations, I've got time to go through them all, but we talked about data trust, because actually in this world of AI, as um, Chris alluded to earlier, it's all about who, who has access to and who controls access to the, to the data. That's what um, a lot of it's about. So we, uh, we had this idea, because small companies can't have no data to test their algorithms on. So it was all, we, we, we were developing this idea of a data trust, which is a legal and ethical framework in which to share, uh, encourage people to share data or metadata. Um, I'm the AI skills champion for the UK now, and one of the big pieces uh, we wrote about in the report was how we need to train people in AI and let people who um, retrain into AI. Um, and uh, we established the Alan Turing Institute, the National Institute of AI, and a crucial thing is supporting the uptake and adoption of AI in the UK, that's what our report was about, across the public and the private sectors, um, through part of it, and of course, that includes the cybersecurity sector. And um, this became part of the UK government's industrial strategy last year. I signed off with uh, Greg Clark, Matt Hancock, and Jerome, a spend of a billion pounds, that's the biggest check I've ever written. It's a joke, you can laugh. <laughs> well, I think it's a joke anyway. I don't think it's coming out of my bank account. Um, most of that's been spent already. Um, it was a mix of government money and industry money. Um, and so how, how is this relevant to you? Well, what I really want to focus on today is we've got this wonderful opportunity, but what happens when it all goes wrong? So we have to talk about the ethics of AI and the, um, how we uh, regulate this industry, but we don't know how to do that yet. So we like to talk about socially responsible AI at the moment, think about what you're doing with it, because you've, we've seen what's gone wrong on the internet. You know, when, when we first started developing the web, we thought it was all going to be for the good. And we thought it was going to be about the democratization of knowledge. And we thought it was going to be about increasing democracy. And now we see all the threats that are coming because of this thing. I mean, you talked about it in terms of cyber, but I think about it in terms of the growth of the access that people have to the internet and how it's, it doesn't... The whole of society is writ large on the internet, the good and the bad. Right, it's all writ large. So we have to learn from that. I mean, uh, we've got you know, the Cambridge Analytica story and Facebook, um, automated vehicles killing people. Although I didn't take an ethics test, I only got three minutes, when I did my driving license, but we expect the cars to. That was a joke as well, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, uh, we have the, uh, the Microsoft chatbot that became a, I uh, can't read it on the screen, a hit the loving sex robot within 24 hours because people gamed it and trolled it. And we just don't think people are going to do these bad things, and they do. And then we, last week or two weeks ago, we had the fake videos of Mark Zuckerberg and Nancy Pelosi and all these things, and how do we tell what's right from wrong? How do we tell what's truth and what isn't? We are all, this is a, something for the whole of society to worry about. We, you know, is it going to make us smarter or are we going to become slaves to the machine? Is it job losses versus job creation? There's a skills gap. We need more and more people to go into this. Uh, data access is really crucial. How do you keep your data private? From who? Ethical and legal issues and algorithm accountability are important. 
we are going to have to have AI audits, AI regulation of some sort. Uh, how ethical is your AI? And this is going to apply to your industry as much as anyone else's. Um, there are ethical principles in all sorts of strategies. This is the House of Lords report um, from the UK, which talks a lot about ethics. The EU's put um, accountable, explainable, and unbiased um, AI systems, talking about that in their strategy. And even Beijing. Beijing, their AI principles from the AI Institute. Now, you take this as, as you want to, but they have a set of ethical principles that are as good as any that we've come up with. Because they worry about AI killing them as well. So, <laughs> we're awash with ethical centers and research groups in the UK. Um, we're thinking about this, and I think I, I think I can say that the UK is one of the leaders in the world in thinking about this. And you have to think about where do you draw the lines. For example, Google came up with an ethics board, and then within two, uh, in not an independent ethics board, and within two weeks they closed it down because they didn't give the ethics board access to what the ethics board needed to do its job. Mark Zuckerberg says, well, I, we can't do control everything. The governments have got to do this as well. Where do you draw the lines between who regulates, who censors, who, who controls? Um, the big uh, consultancy companies are looking to make um, uh, to help companies look at accountable and explainable AI. Loads of work to do there. I want to finish with one thing, though, diversity. Um, two years ago, someone at Google said, well, um, I mean, we have an issue. Look at this room. Women in computing, women in AI. It isn't just about women. It's about generally making sure this stuff is fit for purpose for society as a whole. And when a guy from Google said, uh, well, women don't do computing. Just forget it. Let's move on. He got the sack, and I don't know if that was right or wrong, but I was asked to write this article, and I based it on a, um, a phrase that my mentor, Karen Spark, one of my mentors, Karen Spark Jones, used to say. She used to say, Computing is too important to be left to men. And that's not to denigrate men. It's to say it's too important. We all have to be involved. And that's so much more important in AI because of the issues of bias. The lack of diversity, data, and algorithm advice will lead to unforeseen and potentially dangerous consequences. If we don't all work at this, we need interdisciplinary teams working on the AI. So we just got another 18.5 million from the UK government to boost diversity in AI. And I can't tell you how exciting that is to think about how we're going to use that to help get more and more people involved in this industry. And this all applies to you. Cybersecurity will use AI for both attack and defense. You will be as accountable as anybody else for the AI you use and the consequences of that. So uh, just taking stuff off the net yesterday, can AI become our new cybersecurity sheriff? Yeah, but who's going to make the decisions about who gets killed or who gets targeted? You have to have a human in the loop would be my take on this. As, a, as I said, AI, cybersecurity will be one of the industries that uses AI the most. You have got to be as responsible in that use as anybody else. It will change the way you both do defense and attacks. And it's so, so, so important that we don't just leave this to the programming experts. We need a diversity in that, but we so, so need to tackle this from a socio-technical perspective. This is a societal issue, not one just to be left to the geeks. Diversity should be included as part of any ethical framework for AI. And my mantra is, in other words, if it's not diverse, it's unethical. Thank you.